I'm talking all about abrupt climate system change and the consequences to humanity. And I talked to, touched on a lot of different topics in the last video, and now I'm doing I'm going to film a I'm filming an, a sequence of videos talking about the peer-reviewed papers on these various uh, serious topics. So let me get right into that without uh, further ado. So here's uh, an article on the Arctic sea ice, how it's succumbing to Atlantification. So what we're showing here, this is the sea ice thickness in meters, very little uh, thick ice left. Uh, this is a more telling image of the sea ice thickness anomaly. So it's the average thickness between 9th and 15th of April 2021 compared to the 9th to the 15th of April, average between 2011 and 2020. Okay, so fairly recent. And you can see this year is except the ice is exceptionally thin, you know, the ice is no longer ridged and thick north of the Canadian archipelago. It's 1.5 up to 1.5 meters thinner in this whole region, and there's very little ice in this whole region, and uh, up in some of these regions. So, basically, what's happening is the Atlantic Ocean is the the warm water from the Atlantic Ocean is going underneath the ice. And instead of the Arctic Ocean being covered with ice um, and being very, you know, fre relatively fresh from the melting, the whole nature of the Arctic Ocean in this region, in this side, is changing in a process called Atlantification. That is also happening, I'll show you in a paper um, to follow, where we're getting the Pacification also of the Arctic. The Arctic is being attacked on all sides here and here uh, by warm ocean water, in this case from the Atlantic Ocean, in this case from the Pacific Ocean. That warm water, salty water, goes underneath the ice. The ice melts back in the summer when the ice starts to try to reform in the winter, in the fall and winter, because of wave action and mixing. The fresh water on the surface that's cold because it's just from melted ice is mixed with warm, salty water from underneath, and that's uh, preventing the ice from reforming properly in the fall and winter. So it's much, much thinner throughout the winter, and then it's much more prone to rapid melt in the subsequent uh, melt season. Okay, so this paper here, uh, it's it talks about the uh, some of the things about the Arctic sea ice, and you know, over the last decades, we observed a tendency that the less ice you have at the beginning of the freezing season, the more it grows in the winter season. So this is kind of like a stabilizing feedback. It occurs because ice is a very is very insulating. So if it, you have very very th thin ice forming, the the cold atmosphere can cool the water underneath the ice because the, the because the um, there's not much insulating value for thin ice as the ice grows thicker and thicker subsequent growth slows down and slows down because the ice is a very good insulator very good thermal insulator so if the ice is thinner then it will grow much faster but now that effect is being counteracted by the warm water coming in from the atlantification and pacific pacification uh, processes. Okay, so it's counteracting it. Um, and uh, so this stabilizing feedback mechanism that um, has kept the ice there up to now, we're losing that. We're, we're losing it mostly on the Pacific and Atlantic sides, and it's spreading more and more into the Arctic Ocean. And then very, very soon, poof, there'll be no Arctic sea ice um, at the end of the melt season. Okay, um, this is the uh, peer-reviewed scientific paper that just came out. You can see the date. That's, uh, it's come out in the future. There we go, July 1st. We're not even there yet. Okay, so that's the journal. It will appear. It's published online, obviously, before it comes out into the, the print version. Um, but 
This paper looks at how the sea ice decline in summer and the warmer ocean and surface temperatures in winter affect the sea ice growth in the Arctic. So it looks at the, it partitions it into thermodynamic or heat effects and dynamic effects. Okay, and it finds that the, there's more and more heat coming in from the, uh, this looks at the Atlantic side and the ice therefore cannot be as thick. This is an excellent paper. I highly recommend that you look at it. I'm just gonna talk about the highlights. So here we go. We have the Arctic Ocean. We have the different regions that are numbered. And what we have is we have, um, there's three different views of each region. This is the PO mass model, which I've discussed quite often. This is another model um, here. And this is the data um, from the, uh, this is the satellite derived data here. And what you can see is they, it's partitioned. Gray is the total volume growth. And the thermodynamic volume growth is the bluish line. And the dynamic volume change is the brown line. So, you know, if you add this plus this, you get the gray line. In this case, this is negative, so it's lower. Okay, so that's done for each region. Um, this is the net export in cubic kilometers per month. 140 is a big circle, 70 and 35. So what you can see, for example, is from region three, from the Laptev Sea, there is roughly 70 cubic kilometers per month of ice coming this way, and there's about the same amount coming from the Easter, East Siberian Sea, and those combine, and that's what's exported out of the Fram Strait. And you can see the movement of the ice. This is the Beaufort Gyre coming this way, the transpolar drift, and you can see the different region and how much sea ice, ice growth there's been in the winters in these regions and you know from the different the two different simulation models and the actual data so you can see the dynamics and the thermodynamics of the of the sea ice in the arctic um, this is the satellite data and the two different models and you can see this is mean winter ice growth here and the dynamic changes so there's less here um, that you could there, there's less in this region okay this is um, this is the changes uh, less okay here uh, meters per month the ice growth what is typical and the changes so this is really look and then you can see the curves showing the you know from 1980 to 2020 you can see each of the different regions how much ice is growing um, mean winter dynamic volume change and the wind, you know, for the different regions and the trends and so on. So you can drill down and you can look at each region and how each region is changing and it's divided into the dynamic effects and the thermodynamic effects. Okay, so what we're getting, um, and then, you know, there's more uh, information here on monthly values throughout the winter and how it's changed through the different uh, decades, uh, but I want to get down to uh, this, okay? So this is the sea ice area, how it's changed over the years in the different regions. So it's dropping, and this is the model. Um, there's, th there's three different, mo the, the two models here and the satellite data, they're plotted here, okay? Uh, but you can see the trend, the loss of ice in the Barent Sea, Kara Sea, Laptev Sea, East Siberian Sea, more significant, Chukki and Beaufort. And this is interesting. This is the age of the sea ice here. So the dark is greater than five years. This is multi-year ice, multi-year ice, pretty much vanishing in all of these regions. None here to begin with, but it's significantly va vanishing. The ice is getting much, much thinner. It, this shows an interesting plot showing the the directions of the ice flow, the mean wind directions that are pushing the ice um, in the various regions and the, um, the, the, the melting and so on. Okay, and then this shows you 
uh, sort of the connections between the mean winter thermodynamic volume growth and the mean dynamic winter volume change. Okay, so the dynamics and the thermodynamics within the basin. Uh, and you can see the ice area here from different models. Okay, so basically the, the details are all in this paper, but this is probably the, the best uh, image to have a look at and I highly recommend you read the paper if you want more details. Now, the warming in the Arctic is having profound impacts on the permafrost. Okay, and uh, so this is the paper, um, the peer-reviewed paper that is talking about this permafrost carbon feedback. And this is an excellent paper. It talks about the different carbon pools of the permafrost. So first studies, 1,700 billion tons of organic carbon stored in the terrestrial soil, soils in the northern permafrost zone. A billion tons is a petagram. Okay, uh, and then it's divided up. So surface carbon, this is the at greatest risk of being decomposed, forming CO2 and methane to be released to the atmosphere. So this is the zero to three meters. It's 1,035 petagrams of carbon. Again, one petagram is a billion tons or a gigaton. Okay, this is in the Arctic. In the rest of the rest of the Earth's biomes, if you exclude the Arctic and the boreal regions, there's about double what we have in the Arctic. So the the Arctic is enormous. This is in the surface three meters, so zero surface down to three meters. Okay, even though the northern regions account for only 15% of global soil area, the zero to three meter global soil carbon pool is increased by 50%. Um, well, well, basically, I mean, this is it's it's half. Like this is half of the global number. Or if you add this plus the two, you get a total in the globe from zero to three meters of about three thousand petagrams. One third of that being in the Arctic, and two thirds in the rest of the planet. Now, if you go deeper than you know, if you go deeper than three meters depth. Uh, there's huge amounts in the Yodoma region. It's treated separately. 200 and between 210 and 456 petagrams of carbon in the Yodoma. If you go outside the Yodoma, so this is greater than three meters depth, there's an additional 350 to 465 petagrams of carbon. And then you can go, you, d you can't forget the subsea permafrost carbon, and those numbers are not, it's not as clear how much is there, but it's a vast area. We've got 3 million square kilometers. Um, you can, you know, look at the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. There's huge amounts of carbon there. And, you know, if you take the total of permaf terrestrial permafrost carbon in the northern permafrost zone, it's 1.33, 1,330 to 1,580 petagrams of carbon. Um, add 400 petagrams for deeper carbon in the Udoma River deltas. And, but then you need to add the, an additional quantity of subsea permafrost carbon, which still remains largely unquantified. So huge amounts of carbon. Uh, and this, this is where it is. This is the terrestrial soil organic carbon. And you can see, you know, the highest concentrations are actually quite far south, you know, just on the west side of Hudson's Bay here and also up here. Um, and, you know, in Asia, it's mostly the 50 to 100 kilograms per, per square meter um, of soil organic carbon. And this is just in the top zero to three meters. So this is the, the stuff that is the risk to go much quicker. And then this is the thickness, thick sediments here, um, major river deltas, the Yodoma regions, and uh, continuous permafrost is the purple. So it's there year round, discontinuous. You know, there's gaps and so on um, in the other regions. Um, okay, so there's huge potential for releasing very large amounts of carbon um, 
and my computer is slowing down. I'm not sure why. You know, the potential releases, aerobic and anaerobic, are divided up. Thanks for listening.